are back for another half hour of Gut Check Project. It's uh, me, Eric Rieger. I'm joined here with your host, Dr. Kenneth Brown. This is awesome. So uh, this next half hour is going to be hilarious because we're going to get into chef stories. But more importantly, I want to make sure we're doing a good job. We have our interim producer, Marie Rieger. How are we doing? Hey, guys. You sound awesome. Good job. All right. We have uh, also our guest good. here. I, did, I would like to oh. add, uh, Chef Patrick, when you uh, speak to Eric, make sure you speak into the microphone. Oh, so we want to go like this. So make sure I keep. Okay, so there, there's kind of something I have to tell everybody about. <laughs> she's got yeah. instructions already. Oh, wow. Um, so she's been she's been a producer for all of about uh, what one hour. She's got it down. <laughs> she's uh, so Chef so, Patrick. You need to start doing this, Eric. Yeah. I want you to stand up tighter. And I want to... <laughs> we have this thing. Guys have this thing. Uh, I have to always tell people to come in the studio. Keep the microphone close. And everybody looks at me with disdain. I'm like, look, I know guys have this phobia about putting something phallic looking right up to your mouth. But just do it if you want to have a good show. Smile and wave. Smile and wave. You'll be okay. Smile and wave. How's he sounding now, Marie? Better. Much better, yes. Uh, nice, nice. All right. Well, uh, we left off this last half hour basically talking about your journey on how to become a chef and where you've been. And we learned that he spoke Japanese and, and German and a little bit of Spanish. And uh, if he traveled and, and and at the age of five was able to close a cow colon, yeah, tie it off, tie it off. Your colon closer. Five. Hey, he man. was climbing up the. Oh my goodness, that's like, yeah. like, like it would like have been awesome if they made you every, actually. Everything about that last half hour makes me just feel bad yeah. about myself. Why didn't you bring your homework for kindergarten? Well, I was tying <laughs> off cow anus. It would have been awesome if they made me climb the cow instead of a ladder, though. <laughs> <laughs> With a knife in your hand and the rope around your neck. And like, <laughs> oh. Well, uh, tell us a little bit more about your journey now that we're joining here in the next, uh, or starting the next half hour. You have moved into not just chef work, but you've also been exploring CBD. So mm -hmm. I know you've got a story behind it. What in the world brought a chef who's now on a digital radio station to explore CBD. Well, Jeff Spicoli was my was my hero back in high school. No, right. not really, no, no. So, um, <laughs> but because my, my mother died in a diabetic coma, you heard my father passed of pancreatic cancer, and um, my mom died in 01, and about that time, I'd actually heard about, uh, they discovered CBD, and that was mid-80s, I think, when they discovered it, but they were really starting to realize that, um, well, they'd made the big push, medical cannabis was now legal in, uh, in uh, California, they're working on Colorado, and so um, I was just fascinated by the, how that worked in the body. I, I, I don't like the psychotropic effects of, of um, chemical THC, substances, yeah. yeah, and THC in specific, because, you know, as a chef, I always want to feel like I'm in control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that personality thing. But uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I really, um, I never really partook in it. But when I found out about the, the CBDs and how they affect the body, I got I became fascinated. And so I just uh, I got involved in a business that was related to that, and and now I'm actually a, a partner in a medical cannabis related business and in, in, uh, and tech company oh, wow. in, in uh, Massachusetts. So, nice. But we do a lot of really high CBD, extremely low THC strains and stuff like that. Oh, that's cool. So uh, my my experience and the reason why I'm so into CBD is that you know I kind of had a hero's journey where I saw some incredible effects. Did you have anything like that happen? Yeah. So uh, you know, and I think I, ca I I brushed over that a little bit with my children, but um, so my son and daughter have a I have a 20 year old son and a 70 year old daughter. And when my son was 12, he kept having these um, ankle injuries playing soccer, and he was trying to get into the Olymp Olympic development pool and kind of grow that way. Um, Anyway, so about the third time we took him in for an ankle sprain in like six months, uh, we took him to a, a specialist, a podiatrist, and she goes, wow, he has really long, high arches, and his ankles are kind of rolled out. Do you think he has CMT? And we're like, CMT, I don't know what CMT is, but so charcot marie tooth syndrome um, causes a degradation of the neural pathways between in the, in the extremities. It causes a, a type of... Um, neuro, uh, what, neuropathy? Peripheral neuropathy? Mm -hmm. Sure. And what happens with that, then the... the the small muscles uh, start to weaken. The bone structure starts to deform. So a lot of children or, or adults with uh, with CMT will have like limp wrist where the, the wrist turns in and down a little bit. It's extremely painful. Yeah, it can be. Well, actually, it, it can be painful, but in this case, you actually start to lose uh, sensation. So my son at 12 was about uh, between 17 and 18% deficient in the pass-through of, um, of, you know, uh, well, the, the impulse from uh, elbow to fingertip and knee to toe okay so um after testing they're like well there's not really much you can do just keep him strong they put him on physical therapy um there's no treatment for it it's gen it's genetic so 
um, over time, my daughter started getting injuries, and uh, my son went off to a to A and M, Texas A and M, at eighteen, and as as he was like a uh, eighteen in a week, I think of his birthday just occurred. He starts school, and he was a competitive tennis player. So I know you have uh, tennis players in the family. And, um, or one of you do. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. We're the and, tennis family. They're the basketball yeah. family. Ah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. State championships. Just, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, he was having ankle injuries there. So <clears throat> when he came out of that, that program, um, the only thing I'd found, I'd done thousands of hours of research looking for anything that could help them. And the only treatment they say is stay strong, be active, don't get fat. That's the three ways that you treat yourself because wow. there's there's nothing else that they've known to to um, cause any um, actually to delay the effects of it if if it, if it is going to progress further um, than staying strong and healthy and so he was very active but I found this this article about CBD is actually on that we- a website that I shared with you um, called echoconnection.org. And uh, I did some reading. I called some friends. I talked to a guy, uh, another doctor, physician in California. Anyway, so I just, I ordered him. I said, look, you take this twice a day and let's see what happens. And not only did his focus on his schoolwork go way up and his grades started to get better, um, six months, less than six months later, we took him to the Texas um, A&M. They have a research facility where they do um, studies on neck, back, and spine injuries, but they also do some neural uh, 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 testing and things like neurological testing. So first day they, they didn't look for the they did not look for the genetic marker on that one they we know he has it so uh, but what they did do is they did a, a more comprehensive testing on the, the neural pathways than he had had originally the first two times and it was back to a hundred percent so oh, and it, the, now before he was down you said seventeen eighteen percent yeah but he was probably down about twenty five percent by the time we took him in, by the time gracious. he went in this time to to be tested so I'm gonna kick that over and break something so <laughs> Marie is also gonna scold you for. I know I did. Get away from the back microphone. Away I know. From your microphone. You know, here I'm gonna just I'm gonna be a rock star. I'll sit back. I'll, sit back. <laughs> I'll, I'll play Doc Thompson today. And just kind of. Uh, this is my studio. So to recap, dude. though, your son, the the biggest change that he made though was simply just adding the CBD. That was the only change he made. The only change that was made in his diet. You know, I was very very. He's a very clean eater. He actually started cooking his own food. He was off his meal ticket uh, at school, and um, he was he was on a very um, uh, enthusiastic uh, weight training program that he designed himself. And so, but that was the only thing that changed in his diet and uh, exercise regimen at all. I mean, when we look at this, it, if you realize that Charcot Marie Tooth syndrome affects the nerves, and we know that CBD or the endocannabinoid system is deeply rooted in the nerves, then when that you start decreasing that inflammatory process, and what I love is that you just said the the key here is he changed his diet. We know that food can be just like medicine and it can actually help out so here we have a college student that's on cbd and eating his own food not eating on diet plan that's Mm -hmm. amazing and he'd been well i mean and and at home he was a very clean eater as well he's like the one person in the family that doesn't like desserts he won't eat cookies he doesn't like anything with frosting on it um very low sugar intake refined sugar uh liked fruit but didn't live on it um does he have gluten issues none none that i'm aware of you know i would like to ask you a question he has um his hands and feet are always cold, but I, he does have hair, so I know the follicles can't really, they can't, you know, you can't grow hair with any, without any, um, we thought, I thought it might be circulatory, but I don't know. That's not what we It certainly still can, because there's something called Renaud syndrome. I know, yeah. Yeah, where if you get a little cold, then you, you're, uh, it's an autoimmune, it's a component of autoimmune disease where your arteries sort of clamp down, mm-hmm. and um, it's, Inter- it's almost a warning sign for autoimmune diseases. Hmm. Well, we'll talk about that later. Oh, we'll bring in some more, yeah. And, and uh, people all over the place have uh, Renaud's mm-hmm. syndrome. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's not uncommon. Yeah. I mean, you say it just kind of matter of fact that all of a sudden, you know, he had 100% improvement there. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where people hear these stories and you feel like you're being sold something, but you say it very genuinely. It's like, well, look, this thing made a difference in his life. And that's why people are so passionate about CBD. No, absolutely. And, and look, I, got, I have nothing to gain by telling the story. I don't, not financially. Um, sure. I'm not. Our, our production facility isn't even open yet. We're still in the middle of building it. And our tech company's uh, about $14 million away from making money. So if you want to join in and <laughs> invest in the future of, uh, of the industry, uh, go ahead. But uh, yeah, there's. Uh, I, I just tell my story to share with people. So what did you do when you did, when whenever he told you how he felt and you knew that it was a real 
difference. It wasn't it wasn't just subjective. It was an objective improvement for him. You mentioned his grades. You mentioned mm-hmm. his his mood, his energy, et cetera. So those are things as a parent, I know that you would be able to easily perceive. How what did you want to do with that information right off the bat? And how did people receive it when you shared it? Well, um immediately I started taking the product. I started giving it to my daughter. Okay. All right. And so um because I wanted to know what the effects were. And I'll be honest with you. I, for someone who is so well versed in the in the uh, in the industry, I don't take it on a regular basis. I don't know why. I have this. It's just it, it just falls off the plate with, so to speak, uh, when when I look at my daily supplementation. But um, but so I put my daughter on it right away, and then uh, I went to a meeting with uh, some people that were interested in CBDs. There was a conference going on, and I spoke. I, I gave. I just told my son's story. I told my story, my son's story from my perspective. And then, um, you know, I just, I, I have been an advocate ever since. Wow. So. You and see? we all have kids. And yeah. seeing your kids suffer from anything, it I, just. Well, there's no way, to, I, I can't, um, that's got to be the, the, the greatest loss for, for anyone ever is to lose a child. But even when they're ill, I mean, or they don't feel well, they can't tell you why they don't feel well. Um, it, it is heartbreaking especially when you know they're in pain. My son was having constant ankle injuries and um yeah, it was just, it was it was painful to watch. He would he would just recover. I remember he was he he was a pretty competitive tennis player. He played at a private club in the Woodlands. He was in a tournament and um rolled his ankle, had to take uh, 9 weeks off, you know, physical therapy 4 days a week. The first match he plays doubles with a player he's never played with. They paired him with an adult player and um and he goes out and second strike on the ball rolls his ankle again hmm. yeah it was it was really sad i mean just couldn't couldn't maintain terrible but he'll never my, but that's the thing it cbds are great at repairing the pathway his um you can't ever reshape the structure of the feet i mean you can but that surgery is really risky sure so yeah which which shows that as a chef we were talking about this kind of on break about using cbd in cooking and these mm-hmm. things have you been doing any of that i have so <laughs> Uh, actually, I, I do a cooking show, a cannabis cooking show for Purple Haze Radio, uh, which is actually Leon. Um, uh, you guys didn't know this either. This is Leon Hendricks. This is Jimi Hendricks' younger brother. He owns a company called Purple Haze Radio and another one called Purple Haze Property in California. And they're on the Dash Radio platform, which Spoonie airs on as well. Um, anyway, they asked me to do a, a cannabis cooking show. When I started doing that, that was I don't really cook with cannabis. I cook with CBD, and then I have people talk about the effects with cannabis. Um, or I have them talk about their dishes, but um, it's it's a it's a fascinating uh, science. I mean, because you, CBD, especially, you can only heat to a certain point before it starts to break down. So when you're baking, say, cookies or dog treats, uh, which you know you were speaking about on the last show, if you get over, I want to say, three sixty or three sixty five, it starts to break down the the you know cannabidiol in specific CBD itself. I did not know that. Did yeah. You? No, I didn't know it. So, oh. so cookies are a little softer and more gooey and crumbly, but I mean, uh, it's still a fascinating science. It's it's fun to work with, and it's just it's in its infancy, really. Uh-huh. I mean, we're just learning about it, and as we mentioned on the last show, at some point, I'm a gastroenterologist. We will have endocannabinologists, absolutely, as doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a company here, actually. There are some gentlemen I had on the show that I interviewed, and they have a. Um, they're doing CB now, CBD now, CBD infused meals for veterans. They're all veterans, and uh, they all have some sort of um, scars from that, whether they're emotional or physical. And they all noted that either medical cannabis or CBDs were very, very helpful in treating their um, their health issues. Sure. And um, and so they started a company. They founded a company here that that's what they do. It's Cloud Nine Meals. And uh, now they're waiting, as the medical cannabis side uh, will eventually open up in Texas, then they'll work on putting the THC component in there. But for now, they deliver uh, CBD-infused meals to veterans. That is amazing. Now, you you said, and you mentioned earlier in the last half hour, that you know that food is something, food is medicine, you can help people feel better. Do you find that uh, getting into uh, being a cannabis chef, that it's simply a, a, a stronger extension on your mission to help people eat better and eat? And enjoy what they're eating. Yeah, I mean it is. But here's the here's the thing: chefs are uh, notorious for not leading the lifestyle that they advocate <laughs> for. Nor do they nor do they typically eat the food that they're putting on the plate for the diners. Uh, uh, meals in restaurants are very uh, 
you know, we talk about family meal in a restaurant. A lot of times there's just not time for family meal. So what we do as chefs is we, we allow them to have family meal. We're doing the scrambling for the last, you know, it's like, um, <clears throat> we're like the duck's butt underwater while the great, the swan is gracefully going along. That's the, that's the, um, controlled chaos you see in the restaurant the chef is running around in circles like the legs under the water that look like you, know, you can't even see them <laughs> can you down. describe what it's like so i'm a huge mm-hmm. fan of all those movies like chef and burnt mm-hmm. and whatever hundred foot journey and all those things like i love watching those kind of things it's molten <laughs> <laughs> i love that movie by the way chef is one of my all-time favorite uh culinary movies oh yeah i love it so describe to me what the last hour is and i know eric you've actually worked in the restaurant industry but I, I haven't. So, like, what is it like when you're closing down the restaurant? Tell me what the what time you're going home, all that stuff. Okay, so um, I, I typically worked in restaurants that would close around 10 p.m., 10.30, um, or sometimes they'll have a bar menu. So you may be there till midnight. Um, all right, so basically the chef runs off the line to start the orders and as you're doing the orders, you, you try to gauge whether or not you can shut down the fryer. Is it? Is it, are you going to get more guess because if not that saves you 20 minutes later or an hour we get it letting it warm down enough to take the oil out you know uh clean it so while you're doing the orders then you start directing somebody starts uh, swabbing the deck basically right they start scrubbing the floor but they don't squeegee it yet because you don't want to squeegee until everybody's feet are going to not touch the floor anymore then one person starts going in and pulling out everything from inside under the ca- the cabinet so it's like 10 30 if the restaurant closes at uh say 11. All right. Uh, they start pulling all the food out, changing everything. Um, well, taking stock of how much is left in every pan of every ingredient and flipping, we call it flipping pans. You put it in a, a new fresh container, a clean one, and all the dirty stuff goes to the, uh, to the dishwasher. Now the dishwasher starts getting grumpy because now his stuff's piling up. So you have to bring either a cup of coffee or a drink. All right, to calm him down and say, "Hey, wait, wait, we got a we got a, well, a lobster we burnt. You can have that too. Take it home for your kids." <laughs> right, so, because I'll tell you, the dishwasher, no matter what you think, is the most important person in the restaurant. Because without clean dishes, you have no palate to serve on. So, <laughs> take care of your dishwasher. Definitely. So then the chef uh, gets the orders done, checks the line, makes sure the food is going out, goes in to call the orders in, um, and then you start cutting people. You're like, "Okay, it's really slow." You cut everybody but one person. Now it's ten thirty or ten thirty five, and um, maybe ten forty five. That one person's like, hey, chef, I'm going to step out and have a smoke. Would you watch the line? So you're, you're like, fine, yeah. So you take your cell phone out. You're calling in orders. All of a sudden, the ticket machine goes, it's the sound of money and frustration, right? It's like, tw- uh, 20 top just walked in, chef. Hey, do you think you might have told me? I cut everybody like 15 minutes ago. Well, I'm sorry. They just walked in. They just, I, we were still open. I have to serve them. So now you have two people trying to serve a 10 or 20 top, um, and you're still trying to get the orders in on time. Um, you're trying to clean all the stainless, like everything in the kitchen gets scrubbed from you know head to toe every night. All the hoods, they get wiped down, they get cleaned. You can't have grease dripping on the food the next day. Uh, all the filters from so the hoods. So that part in burnt where they really do scrub down everything, everything. at night, mm-hmm. that's daily. That's daily. Oh. Yeah, and some a lot of that gets done between shifts. Like everything from the waist down in, a, in the restaurants I operate gets cleaned twice a day. So after lunch... And then at the end of the night as well. And I come in the next morning, and if I didn't close the restaurant down, you walk. First thing I do is walk the restaurant with a notepad and start looking at all little things that I notice. I, I open doors and say, okay, this door didn't get closed all the way. The temperature's too high in here because you have a thermometer in every single door for every undercounter refrigerator. I had to throw out this, 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 and this. Okay, so you, you either gotta you gotta make it up. Uh, you get you owe me a, an extra shift. You don't you get paid for it, but somebody needs a night off, you get to take their. Sh- I mean, I wouldn't do that, but you get threatened to. So I, it's been a long time since I've worked in a restaurant, but from my experience and how I recall it, you've only described about 10% of shutting down the restaurant. Oh, anyway. that's not, yeah, yeah. No, not to mention the drinking that goes on just so you can kind of shut your body down <laughs> enough to be able to function yeah, to drive okay, home without so running now, over the, yeah. the nearest diner. Yeah, so now you're a chef, you're shutting down mentally, mm-hmm. but you're doing all this, so you're not eating yet. So I have, nope. I've had friends, and correct me if this is wrong, but they're like, yeah, it's not uncommon to be in a drive through line at Whataburger on the way home. Oh, dude, Jack in the Box, dollar tacos, baby. Deep for nothing like a deep fried taco to fill you up at two o'clock. You in the just morning. got done doing a uh, Japanese Asian fusion <laughs> art slash chemistry. Two hundred dollars, two hundred dollars per person for an eight course meal. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I'm gonna go through the dollar menu. You know, so for me, a late night. I mean, there is a lot of fast food eating in in, um, in restaurant in the restaurant world, just because a you're crunch for time. A lot of times, you can't afford the food that you're serving. If you're, uh, you know, the employee meal, the employee menu does not. Uh, 
typically offer uni. So, yeah. um, uh, so we, that's what they do. Right? They, you eat fast, you eat close, you get back to work. Uh, for me, I like to eat when I get home. So I used to eat a lot of cereal. We had this discussion. I used to eat a lot of cereal, which I've cut out, by the way, now. Um, but for me, a can of black beans, uh, some diced tomato, some diced red onion, some fresh cilantro leaves, uh, squeeze of lemon or lime juice, some olive oil, uh, fresh garlic, and typically chipotle powder. And then if I was really ambitious, oh, and diced avocado. That, that was like a meal at the end of the night for me. If I was really ambitious, I'd fry an egg and put it on there. Um, or, I, you know, and depending on my, my mood, I may or not put a bunch of additional hot sauce on there. Um, salt and pepper. Speaking of mood. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> there's a lot of depression in yeah. the medical field. And there's a lot of depression in the chef industry. What is it? The chef industry? The food? I don't want to food, say food industry. Restaurant, restaurant industry. Food, restaurant, and, be- restaurant, food and beverage. Food, yeah. food and yeah. beverage. Yeah. But, that's, that's but the chefs are very different. It's mm-hmm. very different from... I mean, they're a unique breed. We are, uh, <clears throat> we are very stubborn. We, um, we're kind of um, gluttons for punishment in, in a way, and we, we subject ourselves to it uh, day in, day out. You know, it's not uncommon to go into a bar. A lot of places have um, uh, industry night. So on a night that's typically slow in restaurants, like Tuesday night when people can go out and, or they get off their shift early, then you go to another restaurant, they have an industry night. They offer a discount typically on drinks and, and appetizers. The sin night. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you can pay for it tomorrow morning one way or the other. Um, but chefs will be sitting around and be like, oh, how you doing? Oh, you look like crap. What's going on? Oh, man, we're in the middle of opening. I just worked like 85 hours. This week. Like 85, man, we've been open for three years. I just worked 110. <laughs> Dude, you guys are babies. Uh, I, I'm like 97 days into into uh, no days off, so shut up, you know. And, but it's it's this these bragging rights, you know, and um, it's unfortunate because we don't need to subject ourselves to that. We are control freaks, though, because our name's on the menu. Um, and when you get to a – you cannot get to a certain level without a passion and dedication – uh, to serve that is uncommon in people. You can't. Just a, probably the same in your field. I'm, I'm absolutely sure it is. It's no different. Because it's no different. Because at the end of a shift in uh, in a restaurant, I can still remember it kind of becomes a fraternity mm-hmm. because every you close at 1030, but no one's leaving there until 1130 when everything's been cleaned up. And the first thing you're going to do is go and find the other watering hole that's still open until mm-hmm. two so you all can hang out because you all got off the work at the same time. You don't want to go home and shower because you're wearing mm-hmm. the – the clothes that smell like the onions that you oh, yeah. that you're around all day, and you haven't been eating well. You've been dipping croutons in the sour cream as you mm-hmm. go through all, all day long. Because <laughs> that's you, gonna, how did you know? Because that's gonna that's gonna tide you over. Oh. That's what's gonna complete your meal until it's time to go and meet your friends out wherever you're gonna go hang out that night. And those guys that are serving you, they're not gonna finish until three a.m. and they're gonna go hang out until four. It's just a vicious. This cycle. sounds it so exhausting. And then it is. you know we won't even. This is a whole separate episode. But sleep deprivation and what it does to your body mm. and what it makes your body crave. And oh, terrible, yeah. terrible, terrible food terrible. on top. Sugary, fatty stuff. Yeah. yeah. Terrible yeah. food on but, top of all that. Yeah. It, How, it, how's that different than a nurse working all day in the oh, hospital? Oh, yeah. So my, my, big, my three big pillars are gut health, brain health, and sleep. If I can get, and that's what our member box is all going to be about. It's going to be about protecting those three pillars. You're going to become a better person all around. I agree. And... The thing is, look at the industries. We make doctors work shifts. I mean, when I did residency, we had no time constraint on hours. I mean, so it became that martyr thing. Might oh, be, really? It might be 30 hours yeah. before you go take a nap. I had, oh, really? I've been uh, I've been up for, you know, 36 hours straight. I had 22 admits last night. And that's, you know, it's, it's exactly that. Yep. It's the martyrdom of the. The fatigue. And now I look back on it and I'm just like, stupid. <laughs> we make pilots that can only fly so much because you don't want them fatigued. Yeah, the fatigue mm. becomes a badge of honor that's worthless. And then you almost feel bad about saying that you don't want to be here. I'm too tired to work. And then you start thinking, I can't say that. Next time my uni mm. doesn't taste right, I'm going to go, that's chef. <laughs> <laughs> he has not had enough sleep. It's all time and temperature. It's all time and temperature. <laughs> yeah, we, it's, it's, it's a, it, is a, it is a vicious cycle because once you get deep into it, you're right. You can't backtrack. No, you can't or backtrack. Or at least you think you can't. Well, and you, you, you don't you want to look weak either. You yeah. don't feel like you're pulling your own weight. It's the same thing in the hospital setting, too. Yeah. Exactly. Wait, Eric, Mark, we got about 30 seconds. Yeah. You want to close us out out of the bottom of this one? So the next half hour um, is going to be great. It's going to be a little bit different. We've got a quiz show that you may not know about. Woo! That's I don't, right. But, well, I did not I know about now. this either. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> you and I are being sprung quiz shows. <laughs> we are. And so we're going to talk about a little bit of the similarities between uh, the hospital and the uh, restaurant environment. But they both have their own language, a little bit of jargon between the two. 
You may think you know them. We're going to find out how well these two guys know it too. We'll see you in a little bit. Track student loans can get your student loans out of default, stop any wage garnishments, stop collection calls, and stop seizure of your tax refund. Give yourself a break. Stop the stress and get your student loan payments down to as little as $25 a month based on what you can afford to pay. 800-709-4395. 800-709-4395. 800-709-4395. 800-709-4395. Got an old car? You can donate it, whether it's running or not, to the United Breast Cancer Foundation and save a life. They'll even come and pick it up for free. The United Breast Cancer Foundation has saved hundreds of women's lives through their free or low-cost breast screen exams. But now they need your help. The United Breast Cancer Foundation wants to save more lives through early detection by offering women free or low-cost breast screening exams. And donating your old car, SUV, or truck, whether it's running or not, helps pay for them. Plus, you get a charitable tax deduction. Help the United Breast Cancer Foundation save lives by donating your old car, SUV, or truck. Call now for free pickup. 800-245-0823. 800-245-0823. 800-245-0823. Call right now. That number again is 800-245-0823. Are you tired of high cable TV rates? Sign up for Dish today and get a $500 bonus offer while supplies last. Plus, lock in your price for two years guaranteed. Call All-American Dish, your Dish authorized retailer now. 800-570-6630. 800-570-6630. That's 800-570-6630. Offers require credit qualification, 24-month commitment, early termination fee, and e-auto pay. Restrictions apply. Call for details. Okay, we are now back for the last segment of episode three of Gut Check Project. I'm Eric Rieger here with our first guest, or I'm sorry, our second guest, Chef Patrick Mosier, and of course your host, Dr. Kenneth Brown. Yes, and of course we um, we have to give good props here. We have a brand new producer. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and talk about this real quick. Get this out of the way real quick. This is Autron Teal. If you want to pick up your own Autron Teal, developed by your own host here, Dr. Mm-hmm. Kenneth Brown. Go to lovemytummy.com forward slash Spoonie. Use Spoonie for a discount. Lovemytummy.com forward slash Spoonie. We just heard how much um, poor Chef Patrick has gone through in his life. Yeah. Show some love. Use that coupon code so that uh, his effort right now after doing all this um, gets paid off. And then, of course, go to kbmdhealth.com. CBD with also a lot of information regarding that. All right. Just order a case for the whole family, please. Yes, please Please do this. I mean, after hearing, and and we're going to get into some more right now, but the restaurant industry is tough. Lots of lack of sleep, and it is it is hard. Hey, shout out to Marie for producing. So, yeah. So, we have a first-time producer today, Marie, because Chef Patrick is actually the producer of our show, so he's sitting on the other side of the booth. And uh, Marie, are we uh, are we doing okay? Yes, uh, you're doing great. And I would like to uh, make this my audition to get on the Purple Haze show. <laughs> oh, um, from a consumption or a, 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 a both? Uh, Either way. <laughs> hey, so, absolutely. You know, we're actually interviewing somebody right now. Right now, you don't think Eric's interrupting too much or anything, do you? No, I, I know what that sounds like when he interrupts, <laughs> and he is not doing it. Good job, Eric. Uh-huh. Th- th- thank you. I think. <laughs> A uh, backhanded compliment, maybe? I yeah, <laughs> either way, either way. Well, uh, of course, uh, Marina, we met in the restaurant. I was. Uh, oh, I didn't know that, really? Yeah, yeah, we did. I was a bartender, she was a waitress. And uh, so that's where that's where we hit it off. And it, it was it was one of those those late nights going to the bar that was open after we were closed. This is hilarious that we're tying this in with the restaurant industry, and that's how you two met, because me and Lloyd have met at a hospital. Nice. Yeah. Huh. Nice. Thunk it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, uh, Chef Patrick, we are going to uh, to make our way through a little bit of the similarities between uh, hospital life and restaurant life here in just a moment. Do we want to get anything else out of the way before we do? Well, that? I was going to say, do you have any any anecdotal fun stories or anything, or 
Marie, can you uh, tee anything up here that uh, you remember of being a funny story? Well, uh, we had a great relationship with our kitchen staff back and forth. We It was just, they were cool guys, great relationship. But there was uh, a day where the dish pit guy and Eric were both having a terrible day. And, yeah. uh, oh, this sounds like a good story. Yeah, sometimes. Well, so you had said we were closing down at 1030. And uh, Marie, thanks a lot for bringing it up. Uh, so, uh, we were closing down and he didn't want to take on some of the plates of a, a large top that I brought back. And as I set them into the dish pit, he basically just saw the stack and pushed it right back, uh, towards me and said, <laughs> I ain't doing it. And I was pretty ticked off. So I said, yeah, you are. And we met at the back of the kitchen and, uh, well, we started exchanging blows with our, with our fists and everybody <laughs> came over and separated us. But thankfully... Because of that fraternal instinct that you have working in a restaurant, we met later that night and uh, and basically numbed the pain together away at uh, the local jazz restaurant in Lubbock. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, the only thing better than that one I think I've seen I saw two uh, two brothers have a knife fight in the kitchen one. Oh, yeah, we weren't that bad. Mm-hmm. No, no. Luckily, there was only one small gash in the shoulder. But, you know, <laughs> me with my needle and thread. Shut up. You're fine. You're fine. Go back to work. <laughs> you 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 can take a day off tomorrow no pay but you got to work today sorry do you have any other great uh, restaurant stories that just come to mind oh, whatever there are so many um <laughs> there are a couple of bad ones but um i i you know we talked about the fatigue factor right mm-hmm. um i i i just come up with this uh, bourbon pecan pie recipe it sounds delicious and uh, i was getting ready to make the first big batch and I was making 12 pies, and I somehow, um, in my haze of, uh, of uh, I don't know, my, my sleep-deprived haze, substituted salt for the sugar. Oh. And oh. It, do, it does two things. The salt doesn't <laughs> melt like sugar does, so it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> give the liquid that you need. Yeah. And um, secondly... Uh, it just tasted really, really crappy. So, yeah, so there we go, 12, 12 pies. In the so garbage. I don't think you need that gas chromatograph to show that the molecules are different. <laughs> no. no, I don't, no, not in that case anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, there are, uh, there are a number of stories. And that, that happens all the time. Like, guys will will um, sabotage you, right? They'll switch your salt and, and sugar. Yeah. Or they'll put sugar in your salt. Or... Well, now, now, wait a minute. Who would do this to you? Like, why? Oh, guys, lion cooks do it back and forth. I will say, there was a, there was a fun little game that we would play at... Uh, at our, our Mexican restaurant in, uh, in Lubbock. And it was the, actually the original home of Don Pablo's is where we worked. And, um, oftentimes if you wanted to clown around with somebody who was new working with us, you would say, Hey, they just need this at table 12. And it would be nothing but a completely raw egg on a bed of lettuce and a small mocha head. <laughs> and they would go out and take it. It's like, I need to take, go, go. You need to take this now. And of course the table would look at them like, what the hell are you doing? And like, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really sure. <laughs> oh, you know this what? Kind of stuff. Those hoaxes are the best actually. There's a ton of those in the restaurants, like getting the stale out, uh, the stale air out of the uh, walk-in refrigerator, yeah. go in there with a trash bag and like, basically gather up the air and then go outside and let it open then fill it up and take it back and open that one then get another bag of stale air and take it out. Or oh my gosh. You can definitely do that or you, whenever you're closing down the back end of the restaurant you tell the new guy, hey, we got to make sure that the uh, that the teapot doesn't rust, get all of the hot water out, you have to empty it until it gets cold. It never it never doesn't turn hot. The well, whole time it's, it just well, it's not just the restaurant industry. I mean, in, <laughs> the, yeah. in the medical field also, <laughs> sometimes like the gastroenterologists, they're funny. They will play little hoaxes. Like uh, when somebody substitutes my uh, <laughs> lubricating jelly while I'm doing a colonoscopy with uh, apricot facial scrub. I don't know that that no, happens. That did not happen. That's never happened, and that's why I'm looking at you too. Like, what is that? Plus? <laughs> no, yeah, that, that uh, doesn't happen. No, no, no. We do, we do not play those kind of games in the medical field. Nah, is... never, never. We never mess with your food. No. You know what? Actually, I have to say though, people. I've never seen anyone spit in anyone's food. When you send it back, no. Typically, there. I have always seen people be respectful. They might be pissed off. But I've never seen that happen. I've seen, uh, I may have one time way back in the day, dropped a steak on the floor, brushed it off, made sure nobody's looking, ran it out of the cold water and threw it back on the grill. But I may have. I don't. I don't so, recall. So you probably theory. shouldn't even have put it back on the grill and allowed those bacteria to have Crohn's prevention sure. for mm-hmm. the person that's going to eat it. Remember, we're uh, personally, <laughs> we're too sterile. We need some, we yeah. need some dirt in our life. I think, I, well, I don't think it was to me to mid well where it needed to be. So, <laughs> 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 No nutrition left in that steak anyway. Ken, I sent you an email. Uh, in between yeah, segments what, here, yeah, I want you, you to read that. something here because uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do a little bridge building here between restaurant and uh, and uh, hospital 
life here in just a moment. If you don't mind, pull that email. Well, I'm going to try it. and do this. I pulled it up, and I'm like, what in the world is this? All right. <clears throat> so it appears to be a paragraph of a bunch of words put together. And this will probably make more sense to you, Chef Patrick. Perhaps. Just a right. side note, Perhaps. most paragraphs are a bunch of words put together. I don't really know where the hell you're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Yeah. A bunch of words put together that are nonsensical. Oh, okay. 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 <clears throat> so this is what Eric just sent me, and I'm supposed to read it out loud first time looking at it. Oh, man. We had over 90 covers, two 12 tops, a bunch of four tops, tons of VIPs. By nine, we were really cruising, totally slammed, had already 86 Striper and Tayton. I was running the pass when this huge pickup was happening. We were doing that really soigné risotto with Chanterelles a la minute, you know? The pickup time is like 20 minutes. I got this really green cook on saute, fired her a four by four by three, half a dozen more on order. But when we go to plate, she's short two dang orders, so I had to order fire two more on the fly. She was totally in the weeds. We were so weedy. Food's dying on the pass. The rail is jammed up with dupes. The salamanders stopped working. My porter no showed. I really thought we might go down. So, how do you think things are going? <laughs> I want to know why a salamander's in a restaurant. It's funny. I talked about that on my show the other day. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, salamander? So, yeah. No. So, for you, uh, <laughs> Chef Patrick, just so you know, I don't want to leave you out. I also uh -huh. have. A little bit of jargon here from the hospital. So as you can see uh -huh. here, Ken, you, there's a lot of words that you didn't know. A lot of words or I didn't use. How they, yeah, <laughs> or how they're applied here. We're going to play a quick little game mm -hmm. of who can <laughs> answer what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, just, that just described every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in a restaurant since <laughs> since thirty some years ago when I started cooking. I got, I got a glimpse of this, and this might be something that whenever we knew we were going to have you on the show, I had a little glimpse I threw out to you. Do you know what eighty six in a restaurant means? And you said you kind of heard that that might be it, something's not around anymore. Yeah, I think it means stop it. Is what stop I thought. it. Eighty six okay. sold out. So yeah, basically the the soft part of the of the jargon is sold out. Don't let anybody order it anymore. Or sometimes someone's like eighty six. That guy, he's the hell out of here. It's yeah. kind of some looser term. Bounce. He's, yeah, he's gonna he's gonna get out of there. So, are I'm, you trying to get me to start using these terms with my patients? I think we should use these terms in in terms of anybody you know, and just see how well they how well they handle it. Yeah, it's like I have um, you know, Mister So and So. We have some bad news. <laughs> Um, that CAT scan, the tumor is spreading. You're basically you're being 86 off this yeah. planet. Yeah, or, or we're gonna 86 that tumor out of there. We're gonna or we're, or we're gonna 86 that tumor. That's it. I like that better. That's yeah. that's more of a. You're gonna be just fine. I'm gonna 86 See, that my, tumor. My, my 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 head went to a dark place too. My brain is like, oh man, too bad you 86 that insurance policy a couple years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we got some bad news, sir. Wait, well, hey, the first throw to you since we're talking about bad news is going to be. A hospital jargon term then okay. since we're since we're on the topic let's go ahead and get there celestial discharge oh <laughs> doc is on the roof <laughs> yeah, yeah sort of basically celestial discharge that person's not going to make it they've been okay discharged. so you so you're 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 at a you're at a teaching hospital you go in these big groups of of rounds so we can talk with like the opposite side of the chef industry would be the uh, medical school, residency, fellowship, you know, and so the teaching hospitals are kind of funny. And so celestial discharge when somebody passes on. Mm -hmm. So, Ken, what would it mean if someone needs to drop or fire? To drop or fire? Yeah, I need you to drop X. I need you to fire X. What needs to happen? I would say that somebody has to start cooking something. Ooh, Nice. Like, bing bong. Nice. I gotta drop it in there. Yeah. Oh, that was, was Japanese was thinking, instead of yeah, yeah, in Japanese it go bing bong for, Nicely done. Know, oh yeah, I don't even want to get into that. That's a yeah, whole separate show. Sorry. But, but Japanese restaurants versus American restaurants behind the scenes. Um <clears throat> in the Japanese restaurant the yelling typically com comes at the end of the shift. In uh, American restaurants Is it it's like just, gung -ho? it's constant. Uh, I mean, look, I, I, and, and what's funny, we know five Those words. Those are badges of shame. <laughs> we, I was, I, it's funny, I was watching that last night. That, gun, yeah. that was great. So, no, I know, like, that. that I, you know, five words in a kitchen when you run the kitchen as a chef. Uh, four of them are all the F word, and the other one is please. <laughs> <laughs> it's, pretty, right. it's pretty ugly. So back to you. Uh, weekend syndrome out of the hospital. Weekend syndrome. Who would have weekend syndrome, and what does it mean? Weekend syndrome. Uh oh, did I stump Ken too? Well, no, no, no. I have it. I have an idea. All right. Yeah, I'll give um, you my interpretation. This is this is a unique one though. Yeah. Uh, weekend syndrome. Uh huh. All right. Do I, can I have one question? 
Is it is, does it apply to a person that's employed in the hospital, or is it a mm, good uh, question? Or could it be? Is it is it the uh, usually to the doc? I mean, technically, somebody who is uh, who is em- employed or contracted by the hospital. Hmm. Uh, to the okay. Weekend syndrome. Uh, doesn't come in on Monday. I don't know. Does it? Uh... Tim, what do you think? I would say if you were to say weekend syndrome, it's when you're covering your partners on the weekend. Yeah, and you really just kind of do. You the, just, the you're just putting band aids on stuff to make sure that everybody doesn't die. You're, yeah, just, the, you're just gonna take care of the patients till Monday. That yeah, actually makes sense. The doc, the doc <laughs> obviously sees that there could be some commitment on a critical decision to be made, but rather have his hands clean by the time Monday comes around. And I've got a little weekend syndrome. I ain't going in there to do that. I think he'll make it till Monday. Like when you show up ah. and, you're, and you're and you're covering the partners and you're running a huge service, you just want to make sure do no harm. So the weekend yeah. syndrome is what well, a. Because then on <laughs> then on Monday morning, especially at the teaching hospitals on Monday morning when you're like checking out, like why didn't you order the panuvial enzymes? And you're just like, because that doesn't exist, and <laughs> the patient's still alive. Why don't you high five me and let's just get out of here? Because I'm tired. Ken, what does it mean when somebody hollers out all day at the restaurant? <laughs> all day. All day. In a restaurant. So, like, who's hollering? Okay, so I can use your same logic here. Who's yelling to who? Can I? I'll give you. An, I'll give you an example. Okay. Uh, sh- um, if I'm a saute cook, okay, chef, I need it all day on risotto. There's a lot of people ordering it. <laughs> well, it, it's it's how many orders in total do I have to prepare to meet the demands of all the tickets that are up there right now? To put it applicable, you could say um, we are two hours into our our uh, uh, procedure. What do we have left? And someone says we have eight colonoscopies all day. We have eight left. Okay, yeah. that's what it means. How all many? Day. How many? How many orders do you need to fulfill the tickets that are on the board? Right. That's exactly right. Oh, okay. That's 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 not just what to do now. That's all day from beginning to end. There could be four hundred tickets up there. So, so Chef Patrick, you're in a hospital and you're visiting a friend, and you hear someone oh. holler out from the nurses' station, "We've got a code brown." <laughs> Oh. And 302, and it's not a code Dr. Brown who's sitting across the table from you. Yeah. We have a code Brown in room 302. Hmm. Loose bowel syndrome, maybe? Clean up on aisle six? Yeah. It would be yeah. a clean up on uh, mm-hmm. aisle six, similar thing. Yeah. So if yeah. somebody has a unfortunate accident, it's going to require a little bit of work. It is a code Brown. There are various codes in the hospital. Do you have other codes that you're going to quiz him on? Oh, no. No okay. other codes. So, you know, code blue is the one that's on all the shows. Code blue, somebody's dying. Mm -hmm. There's code green where somebody goes crazy and they actually need security to show up. Code pink, baby being stolen. Yeah, baby. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Big deal. They lock that that code pink. In effect, hospital gets locked I got to come up with a code pink for the uh, radio industry. I got to talk to producer Ron about, hey, Ron. Code pink, code pink, code pink. Yeah, yeah. it's all it's all like extreme lockdown. Yeah, so wow. there's all, and then they have like other ones. So, anyways, code brown is a tongue in cheek word. Yes, you know. obviously the obvious color. That was the only reason I got it because we'd say something like that in the restaurant industry too. So back to you. Now you got to put your clean thinking cap on. Uh-oh. What happens if you go into a restaurant and you were to find a bubble dancer? <laughs> <laughs> bubble dancer. Yes, a bubble dancer. It's going to make sense whenever we, we reveal the answer to you. I feel super ignorant to this. Who, I, who would deal with bubbles? It's a dishwasher. <gasps> oh, a bubble dancer. Yeah. The dishwasher didn't show up? No, that's just what they do. That's, oh. that's kind of a derogatory term for, what are you doing back there, bubble dancing? And you're like, yeah, and then so they, <laughs> then little... they squirt you with a hose as you go by. <laughs> <laughs> now it makes sense why the guy punched you. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I love that term. Yeah. If they spray listening. you in the crotch <laughs> every time. <laughs> So uh, if you were to come onto a shift at a hospital and someone says, hey, you got this patient doing this, you got this patient doing this, and over there in, in same room 302, you got a crump. You got a crump? Man, that's a... Hmm. It's okay. You don't have to I have know. no clue on this one. Man, I just this blank. Pati- this particular patient uh, has taken a turn sorry. for the worse. That's oh, that's what a crump is. A crump. I have not ever used that term before. That's okay. It's not a fun one. I only used bubble dancer once and then he came and tried to kiss me, so I left. I never <laughs> used it again. <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is one of those quiz shows uh-huh. where it's where it's where it's funny because you can find a lot of these things, but the reality is that I you know, that's when somebody takes a turn for the worst, I take it personally sure. and I go, What did 
What am I doing wrong? What did I do wrong? How am I part of this? How do I get this person out of it? Just so everybody knows, most of these terms I actually found just to validate from a Reader's Digest article. So oh, really? I'm not, I mean, I've heard most of them used in context, but some of them even to I was like, I don't know that we necessarily yeah, talk I think that it's, way. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's interesting because there, there is medical jargon and you'll hear it on, you know, all the shows, you know, the people are watching Grey's Anatomy and whatnot like that. But just like you're saying. People typically don't spit on food. The reality is, is that your doctors are extremely respectful. Oh, yeah, personally and, involved. And Absolutely. personally involved, yeah. Ownership of it. You know, everyone that I work with owns that. So you, it's mostly any type of medical jargon going on is usually something that's kind of a little bit light and playful. So, Ken, if you were in the hospital, I mean, I'm sorry, in a restaurant, and you heard that something was going to be cremated or to kill it, what's happening? Um... They're serving live octopus that will be clubbed at the table. I want you to think Chuck Scott style. <laughs> we will turn this piece of meat into beef jerky yes, before it's ready to be exact. served. I got it. <laughs> Chuck Scott is our CEO, and every time we have a steak, he likes it well done. And I just I cringe because I'm from Omaha. My dad was a butcher. I like my stuff rare, mm -hmm. so it's funny because we're on the opposite spectrum. That's funny. Yeah. My dad liked okay. it blue, like. Real hot pan, 45 seconds each side, cold in the middle. But, but So there's a funny story I have about that. Um, I was working in San Diego at this uh, place on Coronado Island called uh, POE's. It was owned by Chart House. Uh -huh. And we had a guy send his filet back like three times. I'm like, so I took the filet. I took a new filet. I seared it on the grill, and I threw it in the deep fryer for about 11 minutes and sent it out. He goes, well, I don't know what you did, but that was like the best steak I've ever had. And I'm like, there you go. I tried to screw it up, and I couldn't even get it right. <laughs> So, Chef Patrick, yes. you're hanging out in an ER, and then suddenly you... I'm getting eat... depressed. I'm spending a lot of time in the hospital. No, no. This, <laughs> this is, this, they, these are just they're small scenarios. We're actually still in the Spoonie Network. Uh, but you do hear one nurse talking to another, and they're kind of laughing, saying, that one over there has got uh, nothing but straight 100% Fabians. What are they... What's, what's going on <laughs> with them? <laughs> Fabians. <laughs> Fabians. <Is> that... <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's see. Is that something, somebody who's uh, maybe hypochondriac? Or it's definitely that, yeah. an acronym, and it stands for felt awful, but I'm all right now syndrome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, by the time you get to the hospital, like, I'm okay. So, <laughs> so, so, so acronyms get used a lot. And so when I was, uh, you know, and most of the really good stories uh, in medicine take place when you're in training because you have time to think about it, and then you get off shift, and then you go talk about it, and they become a memory. Yeah. When you're really working, you're just working you know you've got a lot of stuff to do um i don't remember i think it was sleep it off so sif syndrome and i was in san antonio and there was just so many patients you had patients lined up in the hallways oh. you had every room full <clears throat> and um i was assigned uh you know like these you're in i'm an intern i'm literally it's my first month of residency so i'm an intern and you just get assigned all these rooms and i remember this distinctly i can't even, i mean I'm, I'm gonna date myself when i say how long ago this was but it was so many years ago and it was so distinct where you're just like picking up charts or like here and you know the the charge nurse goes here you go do this one you're it's it and i look up at the board and it says sleep it off and so it's a somebody that's super drunk just needs to sleep it off and i go over and it happens to be a, a homeless man who had come in and he was not feeling good. And I wake him up and I look at him and he looks at me and he's got a totally blown pupil on one side oh. and then vomits oh, no. on me immediately. And I was like, this is not a sleep it off. Guy had a brain hemorrhage. hemorrhage. 15 oh. minutes later, they were doing a burr hole right yeah. in the hallway, drilling oh, into wow. his brain, releasing the pressure. Yeah. So it's... You know, you sit there and look back and you're like, it said sleep it off. That acronym is wrong. Yeah. That's why uh, you still have to go look at people and say, well, you know, and little things like that where you're like, wow, that happened. No, I have to read the tickets twice in the restaurant. But that's because my eyes are getting bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, sleep it off, though. I mean, that, that's, yeah, that's probably good. happened more often. I mean, 99% of the time, it's going to be a sleep it off. Yeah. It's yeah. just that one time. The, it every, only takes once. Yeah. It only takes once to remind yourself ken what does it mean to uh to use the low boy if you're working in the kitchen what does it mean to use the low boy that's when you 
go to the restroom and the only urinal available is the one that's for the little kids? Yeah, it's really, really close. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a funny explanation, though. It's the under-counter refrigeration. Yeah. Under-counter refrigeration. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely is. Okay, so who would be the stream team, Patrick, in the hospital? The stream team? Uh-huh. Oh, that's got to be, uh, you know, the uh, urologist. Nice. <laughs> nice. It's a bunch of urologists. <laughs> nice. Nicely done. I'm really out of age. I keep waiting. Is, I keep waiting. Is, it's still a steady stream. I'm okay. It's still a steady stream. I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, is there a is there a term for a, a group of urologists? You know, there's a gaggle, there's things like that. <laughs> it's so funny. Marie and I were laughing the other day about the ridiculous names that go along with groups of animals. Uh, oh yeah. You know, there's the the congregation of alligators, and oh, wait, Marie, do you remember any of the others that were on there? A gaggle of geese. Uh, it's a congress of something and a. It, it, who cares? There's there's a whole bunch of them there that are crazy. Yeah, no, it but you know there probably is. It's it uh, probably a stream of urologists. If I don't you, really know. Yeah, if you if you look at the definition of all those things you just said, it just says bunch, <laughs> bunch. a bunch, bunch, <laughs> more than three. <laughs> Yeah, so there is a there is a porkway of alligators. What's that? It's a bunch. I don't want to be there. Yeah. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> That's all any of it means. <laughs> That's all that any of that means. So, uh, Ken, what does it mean if someone says, hey, I need you to go there and wax that table? Clean the table is what I would think, is that is that they're gone and you just have to direct, you know, pull it down. Actually, whenever I was at uh, Pablo's, they said uh, they they would say shine the table, but it was the same meaning. But basically it means you have a VIP or somebody who means a lot to mm-hmm. them. You go in and kind of wax the table. It means you, you, oh, the VIP treatment. Yeah. 21 is going to be a waxing table. Yep. Oh, so the oh, okay. Yep. So, what would be a VIP in the restaurant industry? Well, it depends on the restaurant. So, um, food reviewer. It could, it, yeah, it could it could be someone who comes in frequently, right, and spend, uh, tends to order high dollar. Uh, uh, hey, look, and I know or, where you're going. I saw mm-hmm. ratatouille. I know what that means. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, man. So you know, it's funny. Is ratatouille is such a great dish? You know, I've tried to think through the way they do it in the movie. You, there's just no way to do that. There's not. Because it can't, none of it can be cooked together. It has to be cooked all separately and then stewed together. Right at the end. Oh, it's one of my favorite dishes. While we're talking Pain in the butt. While we're talking about food. Yes. What does it mean to have a chocolate hostage? A chocolate hostage. A chocolate hostage. Now is this a wait? Whoa, whoa, whoa! This can, this can be used in my field also. Yeah, you have a no, chocolate this, this hostage. Is, this, this is your this is your field. Maybe I'm bridging the gap here. All right, so <laughs> so I'm gonna guess that's uh, con- somebody's constipated. It's exactly what it means. It means someone's uh, constipated. Someone's being held uh, chocolate hostage. So you know, yeah. My mother ran a group home, a group uh, assisted living home in Arizona, and. Um, Maybe, never mind. Yeah, there was an impacted never patient mind. one time. Let's just say there's an impacted patient one time that what would you, they needed help with. What would you describe a chocolate hostage in the restaurant industry? Uh, I, dude, you got to watch my station. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> why coffee's, are you, coffee's kicking in. Why are you doing that? I'm, I'm a chocolate hostage. <laughs> Chef Patrick's going to be gone for the next I'm run, 20 I'm minutes. Run, I'm running the pass. Uh, so <laughs> just don't order any food because I don't know what to do. Now here's a term I didn't know. Do you know what Adam and Eve on a raft is? And I was kind of curious if you know this one either. I, this is a restaurant term? It's a restaurant term. Adam and Eve on a raft. Adam and Eve on a raft. And uh, Marine, I didn't know it either whenever we were putting together the list. For me, I'm going to say it's a, a two top, a le- man and a, a man and a couple. Only ones left in the restaurant late at night. Oh, it's actually really cool. But no, I that know. would make, that would make total sense. Oh, it makes sense, but that's not okay. it. We we can't say Adam and Eve on here. We we, we were going to call this Forky, but it was too racy. We had to go with Spoonie, so we got to leave Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, oh Adam and Eve, the Adam and Eve. I was yeah. thinking at the company. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was saying some little spoon and leads to forking, but I wasn't really sure. Yeah, no. I kept telling Doc I want to play big spoon, but he was 6'5", so I had to be little spoon. You know. Tom's little, though. Adam and Eve, for you? Any uh, guess? Oh, in medicine? No, or in... no, it's it's in oh. a restaurant. Adam and Eve on a raft. Adam and Eve on a raft. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I don't know. It's two eggs on toast. And I was kind of curious oh, if that was huh. something that would be culinary that maybe that's where that came from. But yeah, it... I mean, it must be. I don't know. I thought. to I'll have to think about it. I'm going to look the origin of that one up because I love the, uh, you know, the um, etymology of words. So where phrases come from and the history of words. Oh. Wow. Well, it's only a minute and a half left. It went by fast. Mm-hmm. 
That was a fun game. Do you, do you have anything else for me? I want to. <clears throat> I want to try. I want to try and redeem myself after losing the Adam and Eve. Uh, the man, thing. anything for you? I, I got an easy one. All right. I got an easy one. What does it mean when I say, "Hey, uh, <clears throat> I need you to butterfly that steak"? You just fillet it in half and then cook it so it's well done. Because it looks like a butterfly because yeah. it's attached on the top and it has wings. Yeah. So that was the the, the first thing you said when you said, uh, you know, think about a Chuck Scott ordering a steak. One of my professors would do that, and he he was this uh, Russian guy, and it was awesome. Um, literally, he we would go to nice restaurants, and he would um, say, "Just cut it, cook it till you think it is well done, and cook it in another thirty minutes." <laughs> <laughs> Hey, real quick. So in 10 seconds, do you know what a shoe is? Because a shoe would be somebody who could make that happen. No, I don't know what a shoe is. A shoe is known as a really, really bad cook. Yep. <laughs> yep. Not the ringer you were looking for. And we got only half a minute left in our last half hour. Chef Patrick, thank you so much for coming oh, on thanks, the Gut Dad. Check Project this today. And everything you've been doing for us. Ken, any closing words? Fun. No, just uh, show some love. Go to lovemytummy.com forward slash Spoonie. Put in that code. We got to make sure that uh, Chef Patrick doesn't have to go back to working in the restaurant industry again. Absolutely not. And if you're not watching on Spoonie Radio, be sure and check out Spoonie.com. Get a full lineup. It's filled with great shows. Chef Patrick, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Appreciate it. You bet. See you all next time.